So hi everyone, welcome to the second session of uh, the 2022 virtual conference. Uh, this is the second session uh, and today we are going to uh, have a panel discussion in the first hour and uh, invited speaker talks uh, in the second hour. So the first uh, uh, session, the panel discussion is going to be about sustainability longevity of bio-curation projects uh, and is going to be moderated by Charles Tepley Hoyt. Uh, then we are going to have a break in between like 10 minutes and then we are going to move uh, to uh, five invited speaker talks. This session is going to be chaired by Nicolas Miliaras and uh, at the end of uh, uh, the conference we are going to have the closing remarks. So uh, we kindly ask the participants to turn off the video during the panel discussion so that panelists can have the video turned on and the organizing committee too. And uh, well, uh, thank you for joining us today. We hope that we are going to enjoy, uh, to enjoy this second session of the conference. All right, should we take it away with the panel discussion? Please do. All right, so thanks everyone for bearing with us. You know, we've already been doing virtual conferences for what two years now way too long and uh, none of us know how to use zoom still so we're, we're not using the webinar feature today we're just going to do our best with uh with this kind of box so uh yeah it, i'm going to introduce myself i'm going to introduce our four speakers and sort of the theme for for our panel discussion today and we're going to spend about an hour chatting uh discussing some really interesting questions that are important for everybody um i think it's going to be a, a good way for people to engage in this if you want to use the chat functionality within Slack. So there's sort of this uh, this way that you can message everybody in the whole meeting. Double check. There's a two box, and it's just like everyone, sort of a blue box around it in the chat. So if you want to write something there, uh, maybe we can get to that during the discussion. If you've got some comments to make, uh, I think for the most part we're going to have the panelists telling us about their really interesting experience. But we, we do want to allow for some engagement. Um, I think there's also sort of this, um, I think there's a question asking functionality, but that might be turned off right now. So if you don't see that, then don't worry about it. Um, and yeah, so, so we're going to have some of the other members of the 2022 organizing committee, uh, monitoring that chat and sort of reweighing some of that information to us. So yeah, like Feta said, please keep your video off and your audio on mute, just so we're not distracted while we're having this discussion and kind of let's get to it. So uh, the, the theme for our chat today is the sustainability and the longevity of biocuration projects. And everybody who's joining us today has some sort of interest in biocuration, whether you're yourself uh, a biocurator, whether you consume biocuration resources produced by other groups, or whether you engage in the improvement of resources that other groups are, are maintaining and building uh, because you're interested and you have some stuff to add. Um, you know, we, we all have this same sort of issue that running these projects is, is expensive and it's costly and it happens over a very long period of time. But this doesn't match up with the sort of expectations of funding bodies and of projects and of the time that people spend within their, their um, roles as scientists, whether they're students or, or junior faculty or senior faculty, they may move on from a certain topic. And so sustainability and longevity sort of plague us in many variety of, of, of ways. So we're going to chat about this. Uh, we're going to chat about some people who have been successful in having uh, longevity and sustainability in their projects. We're going to chat about some of the pitfalls. Um, and, and I hope that everybody gets some ideas on maybe what they can do differently or maybe how they want to communicate things differently when you're talking to other scientists and other researchers, other people who aren't scientists, like librarians, for example. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, I guess in the end, funding bodies uh, and how we're going to do this communication. So. We've got four panelists today. Um, the first one is Nnedi Lagasse from the National Institute of Standards Organization in the United States. Uh, the second is Melissa Handel. Uh, the third is Nicholas Matanzoglu. And the fourth is Sarb Raguvanchi. And I'm gonna let everybody introduce themselves a little bit better. 
uh, then I can do it. So wait, may, why don't we go in the same order? Nettie, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. So um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Nettie Legassi. I'm the Associate Executive Director at NISO, which is the National Information Standards Organization. And we are um, an ANSI accredited standards development organization that is a, I could say, an industry nonprofit. We concentrate on uh, developing and maintaining uh, information standards uh, for um, uh, libraries, database developers, publishers, um, often in the medical science um, arena, but uh, extending to humanities and social sciences as well. Uh, so pretty broad, uh, broad gamut of standards. Melissa, you want to go next? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Melissa Handel at the University of Colorado Anschutz, and I'm the Chief Research Informatics Officer. Um, and I also uh, lead the Monarch Initiative and the Center for Data to Health, which are two different organizations that help um, develop standards and um, contribute to biocuration across the translational spectrum, leveraging a lot of different ontologies and semantic uh, technologies um, to help support basic research data being interoperable with clinical data so that we can realize the dream of precision medicine and, and really create a sustainable infrastructure for biocuration, ontology engineering, and implementation science that actually delivers the outcomes of those activities uh, to a clinical environment. Uh, Nico, do you want to go next, please? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> hey, I'm uh, Nico. I'm working as a consultant for a number of ontology engineering efforts in the biomedical domain, for example, uh, Uberon, Ciel, HPO, RO, Mondo, EFO, and uh, Ufino. And I've been also tangentially involved in a number of biocuration efforts, so most, mostly in uh, also Melissa's area, like Monarch Initiative, gene to phenotype associations, but also uh, tangentially with uh, MODS and um, uh, GWAS catalog. I've been uh, also active as part of the OBO Operations Committee. So the OBO, the um, uh, Open Bio Biological and Biomedical Ontologies um, Operations Committee and their technical working group in particular, driving efforts such as metadata standardization and quality control. Like uh, I'm now mainly responsible for the OBO dashboard, for example. And my ultimate goal in conjunction with OBO is, is to promote our ontologies to be the decentralized community driven richly interconnected and open alternative to well funded commercial or closed efforts thanks all right and last but not least Saurabh, will you please introduce yourself yeah hi chair uh, good day uh, or good evening uh, everyone uh, nice to be here i'm Saurabh ragwenshi uh, right now i'm leading the indian biological data center at the regional center for biotechnology faridabad india uh, this data center, the work we had started uh, last year is basically an effort by government of India to establish a major data center, probably for the first time in India, with a mandate to actually archive and uh, curate a whole array of different uh, life science data sets across uh, all public funded uh, research projects. So uh, we had started our operations and uh, because of the mandate itself, uh, because of the diversity in the data sets, uh, IBDC will end up actually developing several uh, data portals, which would be handling a different type of data sets. And we had initiated our activities uh, with uh, starting the uh, submission and archiving of uh, nucleotide sequence data sets. The data in general, uh, uh, while the data submission policies are as, as per international standards, the formats are as per international standards. Uh, we are also interfacing with international agencies like ENA, MBL, and uh, GenBank as well for uh, shading of the data sets. And uh, this thing is going to happen for all different kinds of data sets with international agencies as well. So I look forward to this discussion and uh, rest of the talks today. Thank you. Great. So, yeah, like, like I mentioned, um, everybody who's in this conference is, has already had some background in biocuration uh, or, or tangentially to it. Um, so I think that during this discussion, we need to be really careful not to sort of rehash a little bit of the discussion that we've had in other panels. Like, I, I don't think we need to, with a lot of our motivation for what we're talking about, go back to why is biocuration important? I think we can start at a baseline in our whole discussion with it is. All of us believe it. Uh, and, and we're going to go from there. 
So maybe just as an easy way to start this panel, I'd like everybody to either give a very short story about a resource that they were involved in that sort of stopped existing or kind of got unfunded and sort of didn't have longevity, or if you've got a better example of a resource that you know that you've worked on or been part of that's really existed for a long time and sort of transcended this, this issue of sustainability and longevity. Um, it'd be great to, to hear about just some different kinds of resources. Let's keep these explanations a little bit short. Uh, maybe Nico can go first since he already alluded to a couple of the resources that he's been working on and maybe he can mention the model of the Obo Foundry. Yeah, right. So, um... Yeah, ontologies, I guess, are a very interesting case here of uh, for of a specific bio curation project because usually, uh, if an ontology is created as part of a project and just really reduced as uh, to that single project, they will die, and this is evidenced by most of the ontologies in uh, BioPortal that uh, are all like great biomedical ontologies, but they basically, most of them are also dead and uh, no further developed. So the really successful ontologies are the ones that were able to transcend over a, a, single, gra a single grant period. And for example, uh, right now we see a big resurgence in interest in uh, single cell data, P groups interested in cell ontology, uh, also more interest in uh, anatomy ontology. So while Uberon for a very long time did not have any core funding, and looked almost dead, like the hundreds of unfinished, uh, of unresolved issues, and people were making requests and nothing happened. Suddenly now a massive interest, multiple grants suddenly being interested in it and uh, uh, stuff moving forward again. So I think this is a great example for a project that actually was able to transcend the, the, um, uh, yeah, the sustainability threshold, let's say. Great, that was a great introduction. And we're gonna come back and, and ask the more difficult question of, of how in a little bit, but let's give everyone a chance to mention something. Maybe Saurabh can go next, since he also alluded to some projects that he's worked on and, and been involved in already 20 years ago that are still around. So I think he can give us a success story as well. Well, uh, uh, yeah, I'll start with a kind of a success and a failure. Uh, we had started a project and we had uh, developed a resource. The idea was that we would be uh, we wanted to develop digitization methods for experimental data sets. So th these are data sets which are actually not uh, uh, presented in a very uh, uniform format in publications like enzymatic essays and things like that. So we had developed formats for uh, how we can digitize every different kind of an experimental technique uh, with the use of uh, ontologies. And uh, semantically, we were able to digitize it. While fundamentally we were able to prove the idea, the database was also published, but then somewhere down the line funding agencies, uh, they lost the interest uh, in funding it uh, further. So we had to uh, uh, take it up at the university level and somehow it is, uh, we are able to sustain ourselves. But going ahead on that, there was a great realization of the fact that uh, at least at national level, uh, uh, the funding of these uh, smaller projects or these smaller uh, databases, they need to be regulated in the sense that now we are trying to develop a consortium at national level, which is robust enough to actually uh, uh, develop into a major entity and which is actually able to uh, handhold individual database efforts when they lose their uh, funding and in sense that if i lose my funding right now i may connect to that in uh, that network and my data and my expertise will be hosted over there so we are trying to develop that kind of a thing and at this this ibdc or, or the indian biological data center i'm trying to push it as the center of that uh, hub and spoke model where a consortium or a, uh, would be developed of different labs which are capable of hosting and developing curation events. And uh, uh, they would provide a back kind of a uh, back end support to people who are not able to sustain. Uh, we can come back to this idea later. And, uh, but that's the kind of a consortium that uh, we are trying to develop at national level uh, so that uh, it gives a flexibility for the uh, projects to sustain themselves even if there is a uh, lack of fund 
for a couple of years or maybe more than that. At least the data should be sustained, even if the labs leave that kind of a thing. So th that's 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 the idea which is of very priority on my mind, uh, at least today. Yeah, maybe Melissa can can speak to some of that, and maybe with the perspective of some of her projects, which have spanned over a lot of different kinds of, of resources and different domains within biomedicine. Sure. Um, and I think I'd like to follow up on a little bit about what Nico mentioned um, relating to Uberon in particular. So I think it's a, a really interesting history in the sense that you know, Uberon was first created in part because a number of different anatomy ontologies were not sustainable. Um, we had the vertebrate trait ontology, we had each different species and model organism group making their own ontologies, and they were not only not very interoperable for doing cross species work, but also not very maintainable by the individual organizations, even when they did have funding and then those funding lapsed. And the creation of Uberon together with those communities took quite a few years, but in the end resulted in a much more sustainable infrastructure that could be contributed to by anyone and then sliced and diced for the different um, species or taxa uh, applications. Um, and even though you know we have um, you know had a hard time uh, continuing uh, um, ongoing funding for that, it also found formed the foundation of many other ontologies, such as the gene ontology, in terms of how you classify all of the underlying anatomy in the gene ontology, and then similarly in phenotype ontologies, such as the human phenotype ontology. And so it sort of had its a different kind of sustainability through the wide use of those more popular ontologies um, because of that foundation. And I think it's important to recognize um, that sort of quality engineering that's shared can, can live on in many other <clears throat> venues, even if the sustainable funding for the original artifact um, isn't there. And so I think that was one of the, the major takeaways is the the quality engineering, the collaborative nature of the creation of Uberon, even in the absence of funding, had sustainability through these other um, larger funded initiatives. All right, and this brings us to Nettie, who's got a very different kind of perspective. Yeah, so um, NISO as a standards development organization really relies on uh, volunteer labor from people across the industry. Um, our staff is really small. There's just seven of us until a few years ago, there were just four of us. And what I do is maintain uh, working groups made up of volunteers across the industry. So we have to be very careful, uh, very selective about the projects that we take on. Um, and we have taken on in the past projects that haven't really have, have uh, been put together, been published, and then kind of put on the shelf and, and, and die. So, um, what we've tried to do with our leadership groups is um, ensure that projects are important to a broad swath of stakeholders, um, that it, where possible, they're actually mission critical. So um, that when they're put out, they are adopted and used. And I think I can agree with some, I could really relate to some of Nikos's comments um, in terms of, um, uh, things that are uh, so unique or so distinctive um, have problems because they can't fit in other circumstances. Uh, so um, it's always a balance between making something uh, specific enough to be useful in a certain circumstance, but broad enough that it can be adoptable uh, by others beyond your initial uh, target group. Yeah, okay. So I think we've we've hit a couple points already that are really interesting and i'm gonna try and use one of zoom's features to to create a poll because i think there's two different ways that we can go in in this discussion and we can come back to the second way as well i think there's two things so, so first is funding is a huge issue and i think everybody wants to know if we've got more funding we can we can make our project more sustainable in the short and medium term so this is one thing that we can think about is how to work on funding the other is how do we improve the way that we do curation and governance to, to make our projects able to surpass the, the end of a project or the end of the lifetime of a PhD student or a doctoral, uh, postdoctoral researcher. So everybody go ahead and try try using that poll. We'll, we'll pick whichever one, simple majority, uh, we'll start with that discussion. 
Anyone have any follow-up thoughts from uh, the first part of this chat though, uh, the panelists? Uh, can I go? Yeah, please. Yeah, so uh, actually there's a very relevant point in, uh, because uh, we, I see continuous in terms of two things. One is continuous of the uh, subject matter per se, as well as then the funding. So uh, in, in sense of the subject matter, if uh, again, I'll come back to the consortiums, if when a particular aspect is being developed and as mentioned earlier also, that the usability of that process beyond uh, particular domains, then you would have several groups which are probably interested in taking up that uh, project, taking up that curation effort. And uh, here also, if you are able to develop very dynamic network of groups or labs who are working on a similar kind of a work, then if one, probably one lab lacks fund, uh, the other can take it up uh, in that manner. And we need to do it in a coordinated fashion. Uh, so uh, somewhere, I'm looking at things like, like we have publication houses uh, uh, for publications and those publication houses, for example, major uh, uh, portals, which universities actually uh, uh, buy access to and then get access to several uh, different journals. Similar kind of a consortium of bigger entities if can be developed, which are kind of a culmination of several let us say hundreds or even thousands of data sets or databases. And jointly, they actually look for an alternate source of funding, maybe not direct, but an alternate source of funding by putting up a kind of a bouquet of related data sets and making it available to the end user. So that allows some cushion work for every, uh, every uh, project uh, to be part of that consortium. And that consortium can jointly uh, approach multiple end users actually and get some kind of a alternate funding so that will enable both funding as well as well as uh, sustenance of the subject matter per se all right so sarab may have predicted the future so the poll went towards the direction of improving curation and governance so as a follow-up to what i just said i think there's a couple issues that we have to think about as we make projects that are distributed over multiple groups and I'm going to bombard you with a couple questions and a couple thoughts. So I'm going to let anybody pick up on these. When you've got a database or, or a resource, not always databases, ontologies, there's all kinds of resources. I'm going to say database just as a shorthand. So forgive me. When you've got a, a resource that's being made by multiple groups, who gets to be the first author? Who gets to be the last author? Uh, how do you decide on this? We, we can always put the little hashtag that says these people contributed equally, but you know, not everybody uh, trusts that so much. Uh, what happens? When with licensing, uh, when a database is created by one group and then modified by another, they want to reuse it in different ways. Uh, who, who owns stuff uh, when you work on it together? Um, let's see, what else? A couple other ideas that we can go towards in this direction. Um, let's say, yeah, what happens when there's sort of problems in the, the way that people are curating together? and somebody decides that they want to make a, a hard fork and then they start developing the resource in a different direction. Um, I'm sure you've had some experience with that sort of thing happening. And let's say one other thing. Uh, yeah, okay, so this goes this, the hard fork thing and the single source of truth are, are, are very similar related issues, maybe if people are familiar with that. So uh, does anybody have any ideas on this? Maybe one other thing is uh, when, when do you like try and join one of these massive efforts, uh, like collaborative efforts versus when do you go and make your own resource? All right, that was a lot of things. So uh, I, let's, let's open it up for the panelists. Anybody want to pick up on one of those? What, what's the Melissa go next? Yeah. Was that me? Yep, please. Yeah, okay, great. Um, well, I, I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about sort of governance and attribution and authorship. So, you know, I feel like, um, you know, bio curation and the development of artifacts, whether it's a curated data set or an ontology or a set of validation scripts, um, that those artifacts are all things that usually more than one person contributes to. And then those artifacts get used in many, many different contexts. And one of the things that we've really had some great success with recently is coming up with governance policies that suggest that anytime those artifacts actually get used in downstream analyses, downstream databases, downstream applications, 
that the authorship um, is sort of pre-declared in terms of what all of the contributors to that artifact would, what role they would have in art in that in that um, authorship of any downstream publications. And so, if you know the contributor was a light level contributor to the artifact, and the artifact was lightly used uh, in a manuscript or, or um, manuscript about an application, then that um, that contributor would be acknowledged as an acknowledgement. But if that was a major contribution as defined in the policies, then that person would be requested to be a participant as an author on the manuscript. Uh, and so it's- um, Just but kind it's of only... interject for a second. Yeah. Do yeah. you sort of mean viral authorship? Whereas if, uh, if our group builds a resource and your group uses it, you should consider adding people from our group as authors? Or are you talking about in a big collaborative group, uh, putting together a single resource that all of the contributors to the resource itself would become authors of publications about the resource itself, or, or maybe both. Yeah, I mean, I was speaking more about the former in the sense that, um, that you know, if you create a bio curation artifact in one context, and if it's a group thing, then by all means, yes, absolutely. Um, everyone who contributes should have an opportunity to be an author, and I'll, I'll come back to the different types of, of authorship in a minute. But more importantly, that if that artifact then gets used by other groups and other applications, that that sort of viral um, authorship, um, you know, should be uh, realized. And I, I think we don't have the best licensing and policies to make sure that that happens. But uh, in the context of some of the work we've done recently in, in, in pandemic times, we've really encouraged collaboration rather than competition um, through the, the, the sort of um, use of full provenance. So if we know exactly who contributed and we know exactly how those contributions got utilized in the context of that artifact downstream, we can always go backwards to see, okay, these are all the people that contributed and with the right policies and governance structures in place, we, there's a, um, the licensing and the sort of policies for use should indicate what the expectations are in terms of authorship attribution. A second thing I would say is there's maybe in terms of the way in which, at least in biomedicine, we think about authorship, there's kind of three tiers. One is, you know, um, traditional masthead authorship, and we can argue in which field first and last makes a difference. And that's, you know, its own tricky subject. But there's being on that masthead list, there's being a consortial author, which means that there's a group, say the ISB as the consortium has a bunch of different contributing authors, and then we can request uh, information about those authors, their ORCIDs, their, their metadata, um, when that publication goes to print. And those authors in biomedicine are indexed in Medline. It affects your um, H index and your attribution. And when you search Medline for those authors, they come up. Or you can be a traditional acknowledgement, and that's sort of a, a lighter level. And, and, um, and there are um, uh, specifications for how to, to provide those. And so I think you know, the combination of good governance and policy, licensing policies and provenance can really realize the full potential of recognition for every contributor in every context, or at least that's the dream. So, so there was a quick question from the chat. I think there's a simple answer for it. Um, so Tiago Lubiana asks, um, if your curation, if your resource has uh, existed for a long time and has many different papers on it, is, uh, is, is the paper that should be cited like uh, the first one or more the most recent one or the one with the most impact? Somebody else just added that in. I think maybe the last paper would be a better idea because it would have citations of the earlier ones and you can find a trail of that. And uh, that would actually uh, be a better logical idea. Uh, can I comment on the point earlier mentioned? So uh, uh, regarding the uh, distribution of credits in terms of publications and other, I think we need to have uh, some out of the box thinking because uh, this is actually inhibiting a lot of collaborative work just because the sh credit sharing model becomes very complicated, the first author and second author. So somewhere, it's, it's not just bio curation, it's happening in all branches. And to the extent that sometimes, at least at national level, I feel some of the problems are not picked up by the scientists only because they are not publishable. So uh, these things actually uh, uh, 
uh, are accumulating now and we need to think on alternate ways where we can hold our credit uh, and our work beyond just a publication. So we need to be more, we need to figure out a system which is more flexible and uh, acceptable also. So we're a couple levels deep into this discussion, right? We started with talking about sustainability and longevity of curation resources. And then we, we started talking about how different forms of governance and collaboration might be a solution to that. But then we got into a totally different issue is how do we get credit for these things? And, and that's really interesting, right? I don't think that we can hash out that entire discussion right now, but uh, it's, it's good to know that th to do these things well, we're, we're really gonna have to solve a lot of different kinds of problems across different uh, aspects of, of curation and, and science. And I think Nettie's ready to, to weigh in on this. Uh, no, I'm kind of, I'm just trying to follow the, the twists and turns. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, but just on the credit, on the credit, just to plug NISO, um, if you go to credit.niso.org, that's a website for one of our newest standards. It's a contributor roles taxonomy. It's a very high level. Um, it describes 14 roles that can represent um, things that contributors uh, provide to scientific output. And that's a standard that we are creating a standing committee to help sustain the work and um, will be um uh we're putting that together now and uh look for um comments modifications to credit um in the near future something to watch that's great yeah so so i would definitely suggest looking to this credit taxonomy so let's imagine a future where we figured this problem out right we figured out how to attribute everyone properly and sort of equitably who, who works on projects and we figured out it's possible to collaborate uh sort of from like a scientific credit perspective how do we do it? What makes a, a project work? Uh, and, and the reason we care about this and are asking this question again is because if we can work as groups, we can sort of be more sustainable in projects. Perhaps we can bring new people in as people age out or they phase out of the, the role that they're working in, like as a doctoral student or a postdoc, and they move on to something else. And so they're no, no longer working very hard on a resource and maintaining it. How do we keep these projects going when we have a group of, of motivated uh, organizations who will contribute people to, and, and some of their time. So I wanna come back to Nico and ask him maybe to describe some of the things that do work in the Oboe Foundry, maybe some of the things that don't work so well, some of the things that we're working towards improving, if you think it fits yes. this theme. Yeah, I mean, first of all, uh, it's already a very big if, if you're saying that there are people that will be willingly pick up any kind of work. So in generally in our experience, um, four years is exactly the time it needs for one to two developers. So kind of the average, what a bio-curation project would have to understand the problem well enough to develop a very bad solution for it. So it's not this is not meant to be offensive. This is just what reality is. And all the great projects are the ones that can, after these four years, elevate to either a community level where multiple groups start contributing and building something together or uh, get additional funding, can start from scratch with all the knowledge they have got, gathered to really build a resilient project, a product. And when we say project, we really talk about things like data uh, um, data architecture so better metadata really like focusing th on things like fair um, uh, fair data dumps and stuff like that um, but also software development practices i mean uh, uh, we can say here with um, uh, with you child you, you just blazed into the community and you taught like uh, six uh, seven developers in only in our vicinity to how to develop better more resilient python packages all this stuff needs to be learned and taught and without having a community like a community backbone like for example the obo foundry you would have never found the place to talk to to even bring your expertise to uh, um, that you could spread around yeah so i think that um uh, yeah the to like for me like the main issue here is, is really uh, the these uh, community issues uh, com community efforts yes uh, they uh, like obo foundry they are uh, uh, super amazing why they work is also still a mystery to me after many years but there are some people out there that really love to contribute and really backscale their own ego because that's like the main criterion for community work is you will never get a hundred percent 
ever of what you want. You will only ever get 50, nothing else. Like this is the pain of a person that works in the community is that yes, you will never ever get your perfect solution that you have on paper. You will always compromise. And I think with uh, there are people that do that. And I think, yes, for these things, it is very valuable and they can carry it forward, these groups. So let me play devil's advocate. When, when should not getting your way result in you starting your own project that competes with the one that already exists? And what, what's the breaking point? Maybe this has happened to somebody else as well. So any of the other panelists, please uh, feel free to weigh in. But I bet Nico probably has some experience. And I know Melissa has some experience with this. So whichever one he wants to go first. I just want to one, say one sentence. If this is about an ontology, then you should never do it. Like in under no circumstances should you go and, uh, and say, like, unless you're developing a different product, uh, you should not go and, uh, or let's say not never, let's say in a, in like, there should be a very, very, very good reason to, uh, to hard fork on an ontology project. Now, some, some ontology projects have different use cases than others, but um, they're very clear. But for software, I think, yes, there is a trade-off in understanding someone else's architecture. So I would say maturity degree of the, uh, of the project that you're supposed to adopt is the main criterion. So if someone produces a piece of code and said, ah, oh, but I wrote already this great library, please reuse it. And then you look at it and it's, it's okay, look guys, this is a library that was written very hastily in maybe two, three years, then it's more, maybe harder to reuse this library than to build it from scratch. So I think that there are some trade-offs uh, to be had here, but yeah, don't do it for ontologies. Melissa, have you ever done this for an ontology? <laughs> Multiple times, in fact. Um, and uh, maybe I can, uh, without you know pointing any fingers, I can call out a couple of the reasons why. And and, and I, in general, I tend to agree with Nico. But sometimes, when science is blocked, there may not be another choice. So going back to the Uberon example, in a way, the Uberon um, ontology. Um, did in fact compete with for a little while and replace existing ontologies. You know, and when we look back on this, this was many years ago now, we think, oh, it's just the community working together. But at the time, it wasn't really like that. It was actually really challenging to get everybody on board with more modern engineering, more shared practices, shared governance. Um, and so, uh, you know, and nobody at the time wanted their ontology, you know, they wanted to be interoperable, but not in my backyard, right? That, we all feel that way. Um, and so I do think in that case that the outcome was very positive and everyone in the end did feel that they had a say that there was good provenance and attribution of everyone's contributions and the sources of those original ontologies as they merged into a more shared infrastructure. So in that case, it was more of a, a subsumption strategy that, uh, but it took a lot of social engineering and care um, to, to realize that goal. So that, that was one example. Another example is, is uh, where I think um, if an artifact in the biocuration community doesn't have um, good governance in the sense that there's not a way for the community to make the kinds of changes or modernize things to meet a plethora of needs, then it may be the case that it's time to think about building something that can actually meet those needs and have that kind of governance. Um, and in our case, you know, we were blocked from our diagnostic tools um, uh, for some of the resources that we use by not having the ability to have community development meet more modern standards. And it's not what we want to see, but at the same time, I think it's also important to recognize that, you know, different ontologies um, you know, are created with different goals in mind. And it, just because they have overlapping content doesn't mean that they can function for all of those use cases in all contexts. And sometimes, especially when you're thinking about clinical applications and interoperability with basic research resources, it, it may not be possible all the time to have one ontology that, you know, only in that space. Further, I think that, um, you know, because our our group kind of lives across this very broad translational spectrum, everything from biodiversity to diagnostic tools um, for clinical application that, you know, there's, there's this sense, especially in the biocuration community of like oboe is like the universal ontology community, but the clinical community doesn't even never even heard of oboe, right? 
So there's a lot of different um, terminologies and ontologies that function in, in different community spaces that we also have to think about how we create interoperability with and sustainability for. And so I think um, it is, I, I again, I don't disagree with, with Nico in, in premise, but in order to get some of the important um, social good jobs done that we need, sometimes it's actually not possible to, to reuse, I think. Um, and it doesn't mean that we can't credit or utilize in some fashion, but every artifact isn't suited for every application necessarily. So, so maybe let me give a little comment on that. Thank, thank you, Melissa and Nico. I think that's a really good outline. Um, what they just said, I think you can in many ways replace when Melissa said ontology and oboe and replace it with, you know, database and your field of, of work, right? So this is this is them speaking from experience in, in their sort of subdomain of biocuration, but we have the same sort of issue in a lot of places. Um, all right, so so I wonder if Nettie can give us sort of the NISO looking perspective. So so one question that I have is. Are you able to be a little bit more prescriptive in the way that you you do things like we're going to develop this resource and we have you know the government behind us so we're going to do this for 30 years and it's going to be funded and it's going to go you know rainbows and unicorns oh uh, well i know i don't work i don't work for the government it's not um nice so it's not a it's not a government institution we are um really an independent independent industry nonprofit. um we're member member based um and i i think the the secret or the uh, the magic comes from having something re be really needed and you never know you need it until you need it, I think is the is the the hard part. Um, trying to make sure that something um, uh, is going to be useful to as many users as possible, while still getting enough momentum to to start up is is always a is always a struggle um, and I can see parallels. In a in very high level between the things that you're describing here and the work we do, um, I'm not sure I have a I have um, uh, uh, the magic sauce, um, but I think uh, trying to make sure that um, you do as much work ahead of time to understand uh, where the resource will fit in or how it how it might be used um, will pay off. Although I think it is, you know, in listening to your conversations, I think where um, researchers are working in their own particular discrete areas and have a have a very discrete need, it may be hard to, uh, to pull up and and find something that's common across many groups. So, so to sort of follow up on what you just said, maybe, maybe it's time that we pivot this conversation back to funding and how this works. And maybe you can give us a little bit of insight into how NISO is funded. Does money come, I, I mistakenly thought, you know, some money's coming from the government. Yeah, so. no, I think I think we are often confused with NIST or um, or um, uh, other, other government agencies. Um, we are an independent standards development organization. We are member-based and uh, our members are libraries, uh, things like NLM, uh, Library of Congress, Library Consortia uh, of Academic Libraries, um, other national libraries in other countries are often members of NISO as well, and then publishers and other um, agencies, consultants, and so on. Um, we also seek grant funding, so I'm, uh, I, I, can, I can see some of the similar um, uh, challenges, um, but that's sustainability, I think, is, is always the the trickiness. So, so um, wait, a quick question for me to interject. When, when you sure. say you're a member-based organization and you have this like wide variety of different kinds of members, these groups pay in. Uh, they, yes. they sort of commit a certain amount. They okay. no, they commit. It's a it's a membership, so they won't pay for projects. They pay for uh, a yearly membership uh, fee based on different factors, um, and that keeps that sustains the NISO office that pays my salary for me to work on different projects and try to help them move forward. And then we will sometimes seek grant funding for specific initiatives that is dedicated to that particular work. And that usually pays for uh, meetings for the groups for people to get together um, or um, pays for us to market uh, the work. And, and so as a lot of us at myself also being, you know, a research scientist, 
um, you know, we're chasing grants a lot of time. Do you think that this membership based funding model uh, is, is sort of I think I think it working for I you? think it uh, well, it works for us. Um, I think I'd be interested in hearing from some of the other panelists about the collaboration kinds of, of, of efforts. I think membership kind of does signify a commitment or a, um, a stake in it. Um, in a at a high level, not in in a particular discrete area that shows a support of an organization and its mission. Um, although I think um, it's certainly you know we're a four hundred one three C, so it's there's there's startup uh, kinds of things. Um, you can't just spin spin things up and wind them down all that quickly. So maybe I can pick on Sarop again because he he also alluded to this move from a lot of small disconnected databases describing different domains to, to larger more to more um, orchestrated efforts and and so maybe you can speak to how the funding model works for those and if you think that this is a solution to sustainability or if it's not really going to address that problem so much so uh what i imagine there are three ways in which we are trying to uh imagine the funding one is that uh, individual labs or research projects which are working on database development and curation efforts, they get their own funds. That's one thing. But we collaborate at the level of uh, getting uh, fundamental uh, processes, right curation processes. Second is that what we are uh, exploring right now is that uh, we are at the data center, we are trying to develop it as a hub and we are trying to get some funds which would be kind of a uh, uh, set apart only for this reason that we may be able to collaborate with other, other major projects and the funding would go via us to those uh, uh, database projects. So we may not be able to sustain them completely but we may be able to just uh, uh, how should i put it just enable them to sustain themselves through rough waters so these are the two things that we are trying to look at actively the third is to uh, make mini consortiums mini consortiums i mean consortiums of projects which are actually generating a lot of data sets and where they are not actually into bioaccuration, but they are generating a lot of data sets like human genome, uh, human genome diversity sequencing projects or other projects and request them to at least put some of the funds from those projects which are generating huge amount of data for a bioaccuration effort. So these are the three kinds of sources that we are trying to work on how successful we are, that time shall tell. But these are the things, so what I was trying to say earlier also was that we should be looking at some alternate, uh, rather than direct funding, we should be looking at alternate fundings also uh, via other major projects or uh, uh, as part of uh, different consortiums, collaborating with them and uh, trying to get funds. So. Uh, from fund point of view, I mean, these are the two, three ways which we can actually uh, uh, go. And the third, fourth would be, which is again, one thing that is happening all the way uh, across probably is to have some very, very minimal uh, subscription fee on these resources. And getting a subscription fee for a single resource will be difficult. But if you offer the institution a bouquet of resources, then they may be ready to give a little bit of subscription fee for uh, something. So it's like uh, uh, getting subscription for Elsevier or getting subscription for other uh, publish publication houses and publication groups, uh, which offer a lot of uh, publications, uh, re uh, research publications. So that is another way of going ahead that if we can, and then, Anyway, in all of these, it is the basic idea is that we need to come out and collaborate in different dimensions, even collaborate, not just with work, with groups which are doing bio curation, but also with groups which are in pure biology, but generating a lot of data or using a lot of data sets. So that in that interface also needs to be there rather than making consortiums of 
just database developers. We need to be very, very nicely integrated with groups which have got nothing to do with uh, generating, uh, which have got nothing to do with bio curation, but they are using that data and they may not, they may not be directly involved in bio curation. That's okay, but they are generating the data and they are using the data. So somewhere we need to tap that potential financial potential also. Yeah. And so, so in addition to that, I think we've also seen um, not ne necessarily a subscription model, but like some some databases have, have turned into businesses. And there was a mention in the, the chat of Phoenix Bioinformatics, which we actually talked about last year at the 2021 incarnation of this conference uh, on how they're supporting the, the longevity of some databases by privatizing them. This has also been the case for Drug Bank, which is a resource that a lot of people are using within systems pharmacology and systems biology. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes left, and I kind of want to make one final round uh, I, one big question for all of you. And then I think we can have a couple minutes to, in, uh, to engage with some of the questions that people have been asking in the chat. But thank you already for everyone who's been participating there. We've seen some nice side discussions happening. So, so the last big question I wanna ask, we give everyone the chance to, to respond to this and, and maybe uh, we can just sort of have an open discussion between the panelists. Um, how do grants need to change in the future? How do you think they should change? Or let's say, what would the one thing you would want them to improve? Anyway, take this for however you want, but what do we need to do to make grants more efficient, to better reflect the actual needs of the community, the people that these grant uh, bodies are serving, especially when they're coming from government grants. This should be for public good in many cases. How do we best most efficiently use the money? Uh, how do we stop producing stuff that goes away at the end of the grant as well? I'm sure you have lots of ideas about this. We've, we've already taken notes together about these things. So uh, anyone who wants to go first, Raise your I, hand, Melissa. I can start. Sure. So, um, two things um, that I just wanted to comment on. I, I think it's a really good question, um, and I think there's multiple parts to the answer. Uh, answers. Um, you know, the first thing is I think that fundamentally, and one of the things that we've been pushing here in the U.S. Uh, the NIH to do is is and, and there are a couple examples of, of basically the people who are expert in biocuration data standards development are not necessarily the people writing the average grant and so the funding programs we've been recommending to them that they include budget for collaboration with standards organizations or biocuration experts and the problem is is that say for example going back to the uberon example you don't necessarily need a full-time Uberon developer, you know, on your, you know, gene expression project. You just need part of one, and you need to make sure that that's part of the standardization process and the data sharing process. And so, coming up with funding models at NIH to help support that kind of collaboration with biocuration groups that can actually help um, with their expertise, recognizing that the data providers are not usually the experts in data reusability and data sharing. This and and so the the best example of that at NIH is the um, NCI's ITCR program that helps fund um, those types of collaborations, but we're trying to expand that to, to other venues. The second thing is the new NIH data sharing policy, which many of, of you all in the US um, helped contribute to comments to, um, to really actually have accountability around the data sharing and the standardization activities. And while um, we did not successfully get that to be part of the grant review process, which I think would have been helpful, it is part of the accountability on an annual cycle for those grants. And the data must be shared in such a way as to meet the rigor and reproducibility requirements that um, are in negotiation with the funding agency. And that is new and absolutely wonderful thing to have in hand. So it's now um, actually part of the funding proposal. So there's budget in the budgets for these new, for the new grants going forward that will go to supporting um, those types of activities to make sure that the data is well curated and well disseminated. Go NIH. That sounds great. Seems like we can address some of the things we already chatted about. Um, Nettie, do you want to go next? Maybe you can take this discussion in a different direction since we've already chatted about how your organization is funded and how that works a little bit differently. But what do you think could be improved about the process through which NISO gets its money to, to uh, support its longevity and sustainability? Well, for, for grants, I think all of our, the grants that we do receive, they all include um, a piece for marketing. I think mar I, that's something we haven't talked about so far, or maybe that's something that is inherent in everything you do, but you need to talk about what you're doing and get the word out 
and uh, find other collaborators, communities to, to keep it going after it's created. Um, you know, we think of marketing as advertising and yeah, it is, but it's um, uh, really uh, can be uh, so um, important to be able to, to uh, keep, keep, it, keep it flowing and include, include funding for that in the grant itself. I think the phrase Melissa used earlier was social engineering. Yeah, that's a good one. Tangential. Yeah, yeah. I've also personally found that a lot of the work is, is put into working with stakeholders of people who might want to use your resource, because if no one's interested in it and you're working in a corner, then it's not going to be. But they've, they've got to know about it in the first place, too. Mm -hmm. So. All right, Nico. All right, I uh, can only second many of the things that were already said. Uh, I have uh, three things um, I would emphasize. So the first is we need to, in all grant applications, more clearly recognize the development, the de dependencies that we have built up in our um, uh, for our bio curation project. So this is tools like uh, that we use for curating ontologies, as well as general tools for performing bio curation. I have seen many of them die along the way because they were created uh, in the beginning and then never may continue to be maintained. And I think that this needs to be more clearly recognized that we just need small percentages on the grants that contribute to ontologies, contribute to uh, put to these upstream tools to make them gradually improve and ever go better. This, I think, is a great catalyst for improving the general state of the whole community. The second is, um, uh, I think that what would be amazing would be um, a much more low key grant scheme that allows for maintenance of resources, like something where, you, for example, in ontology, if you, we want to just do the bare minimum, right, like the absolute bare minimum bug fixes, releases, regular releases and doing like the very, the, this doesn't cost much money this is like a thing that you can that one let, that you can do in with 0 0.2 fdes and if you have that for 10 years this is a massive backbone for the community to have some person be there for doing these kinds of things i think if there was quick grants that could be offered like that like 0 0.2 fdes to maintain a resource that would be super helpful and the last thing is, I think that there needs to be a real, like, uh, I mean, it, I the recent grants I read from Melissa, they all have already like super d d uh, amazing data governance plans. But I really think that we need to uh, make it make it ne almost necessary to have to commit to specific. Uh, data quality indicators for the public uh, for the for the data releases, for example, like fair data assessment tools, uh, whatever you want to call it, but there needs to be some concrete benchmarks that says all the all the data you create needs to be published with a persistent identifier. All of them have to be published in a accredited resource. All of them have to have a certain standard, something like that. And I think that this is really a really important thing that we need to move towards fair data sharing and really actionable evaluation criteria for the data dumps that are created by the resources. You know, I'm not supposed to interject with, with my own ideas since I'm moderating, but something that we didn't touch at all is that like all data should be curated in version control. Just stop doing it inside your own databases that nobody can see. We'll get a really long way just by doing that. Okay, so so to end uh, the the last big question about grants and and how do you think that money can be better used? What what should funding organizations and grant givers do? How do you think that this is? Uh, what's your perspective, Sarab, on on how this might be improved, especially from you know working in these bigger consortia now? Yeah, so uh, the one line for the funders would be that if they are funding a project which is generating data of hundred dollars. So out of that hundred dollars, fifteen to twenty dollars, they should reserve for curation and database efforts. There is no sense in funding projects which are generating data sets and not giving funds for their curation and sustenance. It, it's totally absurd, actually. So uh, that is something that we need to somewhere make everybody understand. Somewhere I feel that this, while a lot of us, almost everybody knows about it but that grit that feeling from in from your inner self that to a typical balance that this is very very important for me and let me shell out some money for that from my grant that is not there 
So we need to interface more on these so that the funding agencies get a better idea that this is not something they can escape from. They are putting money to generate data, they should put money to conserve it also. It's plain and simple, actually. I think that's a great place that? to sort of end it with our, with our panel discussion. Now, I, I think this is, we, we've really come full circle with some of the big overarching topics that are, that are addressing longevity and sustainability. How do we work better as a community? How do we re use resources in the best way? How do we uh, work in social engineering? How do we get funding to be more appropriate for, for things that are better for the community and for science as, as a whole? Uh, I think that as, as we sort of finish up this discussion, it would be nice to, to get the chance for people who are listening in the chat. And I've, I've been looking at the numbers and we've, we've had very good retention throughout this hour. So thanks everybody for listening. If anybody has any questions that they wanted to ask, we can kind of go through the chat and maybe I'll take one or two of them and then we can end on time and we can have our nice little break before the speaker session begins. So please go ahead, if you've got a question, write it in the chat now, and I will pose it to our panelists as we finish up this panel discussion for ISB 2022, session number two. All right, so there's one question in the chat already uh, from Lenora Reise from Tear. This is, uh, yeah, this is, the Aridopsis resource, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and the question is, so should every research grant uh, include funding or curation of their data, or do you just mean grants for databases? Maybe Saurabh can answer this one. Well, definitely both, because uh, while conserving data is important, but you can't just put the data, you need to generate knowledge out of it. And knowledge generation is basically requires curation. So curation and data uh, generation, uh, data deposition, both, they should be supported. And how how that money needs to be divided and distributed, that is something that the bio-curation database community must come up with a formula. That, okay, this is our expenses for data uh, uh, deposition services, and this is, our, uh, this is the thing for data curation. All right. So let's do rapid fire. There's maybe two or three more questions, and I think they're all really good ones, so I want to touch them. Montana Smith asks, we're developing ontologies and standards and talking to researchers about their importance, but I always hear it's too hard, and I don't understand, and I don't have time, and there's too many terms. And what do we say to that? How do you convince people it's worth it and uh, to, to the researchers to do this sort of work in both the short and the long term? So, so this is going outside of the people who are already here. Maybe we're preaching to the choir, but go ahead, Nico. How do you explain this to people that it's important? So I don't want to answer how I explained this will take another hour, but uh, I think that one of the key issues here is, is I don't have time and uh, I think that I don't have time really means you, they don't really see that they should prioritize it. That's what I don't have time usually means. And I think that one of the key bits that I would generally encourage all grants that are involving ontologies anywhere, that they make sure that both their curators and their software engineers re get relevant training also. They should understand the logic why you should use an ontology. There are some good resources already that, that can explain this, but I think that some kind of internal teaching program that allows to um, that allows to get people at least the, uh, the wrap the head around the basics is very important. But the second thing that it is really hard is very true. So I think that you that um, I would discourage most of the ontology projects that have been started in the world generally from the onset because a really scalable, rich, logically rich interrelated ontology development does require some serious expertise like for debugging with logicians and stuff like that. And I think that uh, it's definitely better to uh, not develop an ontology than to develop a very bad one. And in this case, I would say, um, uh, yeah, it is like, I would really say, in this case, it's really important that people also understand when not to develop an ontology. That's always how I start the talks. Do not develop an ontology, full stop. All right. Um, so I want to give Nettie and Melissa the, the chance to just put in a last word, and then we're going to close this session up and we're going to take a, a break. So I, know I would I would agree with Nico. I think that's something we're trying to do at NISO is try to figure out what we should not be developing um, and where to where to draw the line. You can't develop everything for everyone, 
um, it's important to figure out where to prioritize your resources and create something that's really good. Yeah, I, I would agree as well. I mean, I think, and it's it's funny, I, I, I have two mantras. One is I, despite the fact that I'm an ontologist by training and, and you know, really promote the use of ontologies, I more often than not talk people out of building ontologies. <laughs> um, and, and the second thing I would say is if we as ontologists do our jobs right, nobody knows we were actually there. Um, and so, because it should be so intuitive in terms of how it represents the, the domain that's, that's being represented. But I think coming back to something that Nico said and that, and that you, Charlie, had said earlier, I, I, I feel like a lot of it is education. Like we need to start training people earlier in, you know, like when people go to Amazon and they search for things, they don't really understand that there's an army of ontologists and other sort of semantic engineers that, that are behind that. Why aren't we doing that? Why aren't we teaching those kind of that understanding in uh, biomedicine and biology in general, um, you know, upstream? And I think with a little bit more, um, you know, understanding of how such systems actually work, what makes it intuitive so that you don't know that there's that ontology or army of engineers behind the scenes doing that work. We just need to be more, more um, apparent uh, and, and, and help people understand that upstream and then they'll be more willing to contribute to existing resources rather than developing something de novo or just not wanting to develop it at all. That's a great place to leave it. Nobody said machine learning yet, so I'll do it. Uh, I'm glad that we didn't talk about that at all. Thank you everybody for not mentioning machine learning. So we're gonna take a 10 minute break. Thank you everybody for sticking on so far. Thank you so much to the panelists for your amazing wisdom that you're willing to share with us and, and going through some of these bizarre questions and taking them in stride. All your perspectives are super appreciated. And I think everybody listening learned something today. Thank so you, like Charlie. I said, we're gonna take a 10 minute break. We've got, uh, so it's 10 minutes past the hour right now, depending on your time zone. We're going to begin the speaker sessions at 20 minutes past the hour. So in the meantime, go, go grab some water, take a bio break, uh, make yourself some dinner, some lunch, some breakfast, depending on where you are. Uh, and then we'll see you in a little bit. I'd like to ask that the panelists please stay for a minute because we're gonna try and take a, a janky Zoom screenshot that we can share with the world. Um, for any of the speakers who are floating around, we can uh, double check that your, um, your, your video is working properly too in this break. So thanks everybody. See y'all in a bit. Thank you, Charlie. I already got a picture with the oh, panel. Good. So now we need a picture with speakers in 10 minutes or so. Okay, we do that right before the speaker session starts. Did you take a picture while we're all making funny faces? Kind of. <laughs> that was a great discussion everybody i really yeah that it. was good i enjoyed it thank you so much i learned a lot too yeah me too thank you everyone there are also many interesting information in the chat so i suggest yeah, you have a look I at agree. this there's a yeah, comment okay. from peter and uh, petra tanya if Peter hadn't already joined us, it would, be, it would have been great to, to drag him into this discussion panel as well. I think he had a lot of really interesting uh, parts of, of his discussion panel in the first session this year that would have really nicely motivated this. And, and let's be honest, you know, I was thinking about this stuff back then, and this is how I, I pushed the concept to be sort of our, our discussion topic today. Wonderful. We need to do this again when we have the in-person meeting uh, next year with some red wine and uh, some yeah. tapas, Italian yeah. tapas, some Asiago cheese. Yes, <laughs> sign me up. <laughs> all, right. all right, well, I'm gonna head out to my NIH call and just wanna say thanks to all of you for wonderful discussion and um, be well, stay safe. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Melissa, Bye. nice to see you. Bye. Nice to see you too. Bye-bye. I'm just going to step away for a couple of minutes here. Same. Is, is it okay if I quickly do a screen share test right now? Are you in the screenshot now, the selfie? Uh, oh, no, no, just uh, I crashed. I mentioned in the screen the, I, Yeah, I we, are, mm -hmm. uh, we are going to take okay. a screen with all the speakers and uh, the organizing committee before you start uh, the speaker session. I'm sorry, I was just wondering if I could do a screen share test again during the break because my Zoom crashed and then I want to just check that everything's still working. Yeah, we still have to do it.
Don't worry. Right. Oh, we're, we're doing another round of testing of screen sharing. We don't need it, right, Nick? Oh, sorry. I'm just screen asking sharing. if I can't because oh. I crashed and Go I just ahead. want to make sure Do it. No. it's still working. Okay, thank you. So I give the speaker control, right? Because uh, I'm a host when they come up. Okay. okay. That's, and you can see everything fine? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Perfect. That's all I needed. Thank you. Great. Be right back. Yes. So, so far, no problems, Fede, and maybe we can make it clear that people can, uh, for the next session, can put the questions in the chat. Next session is actually going to be a bit different in the sense that it's the last one, yeah. and we're going to have the annual general meeting, uh, followed by the poster session in... Um... No, I mean, no, no, I mean here, uh, session oh, to the talks. Yeah, I know the October session. I don't mean that. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have uh, in this Zoom Q&A, so I think we use the chat for... Oh, we use the chat because this is yeah, not yeah. Zoom webinar, like the previous yeah, yeah, session. Yeah. This is Zoom meeting. Yeah. So I think it is good to make that clear that we will use chat for Q&A. It is interesting that uh, for bio-curation, whether we get a direct funding grants for bio-curation to individual databases or whether we get the money through the different projects that are funded by federal agencies, and then it is shuttled to the bio-curators. Eventually, the money is coming from the government agencies, uh, either from NIH or NSF or likewise. Uh, so, so, you know, the other idea is the long-term sustainability of databases and advocacy for that at the federal funding level. So you don't have to deal with each individual project to have the provision for bio-curation, but rather have some kind of the dedicated money for core and important biological resources and for so either way, money is coming from the federal agencies anyway. Somehow we ended up talking a lot about ontologies there. But I think, uh, yeah, same goes for every resource. Um, is, is Lauren on the line? Do you want to try doing your screen share now? I am on the line. I you share your screen? I'm on, a, I'm on an iPad and it's very weird. Um, so I, it hasn't worked, but I will, I will try again and see what happens. When I hit screen share, it just gives me the option to share my Zoom screen, which obviously isn't what I want. 
Well, okay. If you're if you're on the iPad, then one of us. So Nick, either you or me, maybe. Yeah, better I, I just it. I just messaged Nick actually um, privately because uh, I, I think that was speaking to. Do I need to give Lauren to control, or she can share her screen? No, no, she's having a problem with sharing her screen because yeah, of her, her system setup. So, so one of us, either you or me, can actually run the slides, share our screen, and then she can go ahead and present it and just say like next slide when she's ready. I actually, I had. <laughs> I had just messaged Nick privately. Um, I'm actually traveling at the moment and I'm about to board a train like at the exact time that my talk is. So I was wondering if someone else would be willing to go first so that I have time to get on the train. I know that's kind of ridiculous. I don't mind going first. Um, if that's right. easy. Um, I really appreciate it. That's trying to bring up your slides here. No, Nick, sure if you're moderating, screen. I'd be happy to run the slides so you can just uh, worry about that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, here we go. So I'm just loading your presentation. Okay, I guess from the beginning. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, so, so Nick, okay. we're going to start. Yes, with, yes, uh -huh. I'm getting started then, here. Just uh, after we're second, I introduce our speakers. Welcome back, everybody, to um, the afternoon session for. Uh, International Society for Biocuration. And our first speaker is Lauren Wishney from University at Buffalo. And, um, oops. Um, so Lauren is a PhD student. In, hold on, sorry, Nick. Nick um, yes. We're, we're going to have Montana go first. Oh, uh, Montana. Because Lauren's oh, sorry. Of the technical hey, stuff okay. going on at the moment. Um, my apologies. Our first speaker is Montana Smith. Montana is an earth scientist at the Environmental Molecular Sciences Laboratory at Pacific Northwest National Lab. And um, research interests are in soils with a focus on carbon and nitrogen cycling and microbial responses to climate change. Her experience in the field and working with data have been applied to improve and expand metadata collection, management, and interoperability with EMSL user pro projects and, uh, and MDNC. Um, metadata, uh, so let's, um, title of her talk is Metadata Curation to Ensure Cross-Lab Interoperability and Data Discovery of Multi-Omics Data in the National Microbiome Data Coll Collaborative. Um, so let's get started with Montana. Thank you. Montana, you're on mute. It's it. There we go. Now you can hear me okay. Yep, yes. all good. We practice this, but of course, as soon as you actually go to do it, everything goes wrong. Um, <laughs> all right, um, so hi everyone. Thanks so much for being here today. Um, I'm excited to present to you the work that we've been doing on the National Microbiome Data Collaborative or the NMDC to improve metadata curation and discovery for multiomics data. So we've kind of talked a little bit about it today, but um, you know, large scale environmental research and modeling, especially in the context of climate requires a lot of data. Um, however, generating these multiomics data can be really expensive and difficult. And to enable wide scale research, data reuse and interoperability is really gonna be the key to making these projects happen. 
So the NMDC's mission is to provide a gateway to fair multiomic microbiome data that leverages best practices for data curation and processing. This project's been uh, working through with a collaborative as a collaborative effort across multiple national labs, as well as engaged really closely to the research community to understand their needs and willingness to participate. Um, so you can kind of think of the NMDC as like a card catalog for microbiome data. We provide a place for researchers to search for samples across multiple projects and different data types and sample types. And we also provide standardized workflows for processing and analyzing these multiomics data. And that inclu includes currently metaproteomics, metagenomics, metatranscriptomics, and metabolomics, as well as natural organic matter via FTICR. And so providing these standardized workflows across these different data types is really how we're going to enable these large scale cross project analyses to answer large scale research questions. So to accomplish this, clear and concise interoperable metadata, as I said, is definitely required in a standardized machine readable formats. And to help researchers understand these metadata types and the when and where they apply, the NMDC has identified four categories. And these are sample preparation, data processing, and feature metadata. Especially important for data sharing within the NMDC are the sample metadata, which identifies the sample you're working with. So the when, where, what, how of your experiment as well as preparation metadata, which details how you go from a sample in an experiment such as soil or a plant root to the analytical sample, as we're calling it, that can actually go onto an instrument. So you can think of this as going from soil to purified DNA or extracted metabolites. Without standardized metadata, data reuse, data sharing, sample interoperability, it's all really, really difficult. I'm sure we've all here, all of us here have had experiences of trying to work with someone else's data or sometimes even matching multiple data types within your own experiment can be really difficult and science quickly becomes this jumbled mess that's much harder than it needs to be. But when we use standardized metadata, the context and connections across samples and data types become significantly more clear. Identifying sample metadata about the when, where, and what of a biosample ensures the environmental context and experimental information across studies is captured. So biological differences or responses can be understood. Standardized preparation and data processing metadata are needed to know how a biosample was prepped or extracted and how to compare across studies or data types. So as I mentioned before, preparation metadata, you can think of this as going from soil to purified DNA and data processing you can think of as going from the raw peaks that you get off of a mass spec or the raw data and how it's analyzed or annotated for further analyses. And without these factors, these large scale analyses and modeling and correlating your results wouldn't be possible. So overall standardized metadata and curated standards at each of these steps ensures that details aren't missed. And when a factor or detail is called one thing in source A, you know how it's similar to or different to something in source B and how to relate those when you get to targets. So to improve on this, the NMDC has developed a standards-based schema for sample identification and database curation that leverages a lot of the existing ontologies and resources and standards out there. Uh, a few that we have leveraged for sample metadata include the minimal information about any sequence or mixes from the Genomic Standards Consortium. We also are leveraging environmental identifiers, including the ENBO triad um, and using the OBO um, ontologies from that, as well as the Genomics Genome Standards Online Database, or GOLD. So all of these workflows and um, standards are being implemented into the NMDC portal, where researcher, real researchers can provide and find information about study and standardized sample metadata and data identification. So the data portal is a place for data discovery. Multiomics data across a variety of projects or sample types can be found here using any combination of search functions, including the map that you see here where you can search by location or any of the standardized metadata terms that you see here on the left. So as well as a functional search, which you see we provide via kick terms. The data portal provides information about a biosample as well as any multiomics data associated with those biosamples. So here you can see that there is this study that has been provided to the NMDC portal. And then these are the individual biosamples and you can see the metagenomics, metaproteomics and metabolomics are all data types that have been generated for this biosample. 
Now to get your study samples, metadata and data into the NMDC data portal, we've recently rolled out our submission portal, which can be accessed via the data portal. This is currently live and um, available for beta testing if you're interested. Um, and so I just wanna highlight a few features that we've built into this um, to improve on and expand metadata standardization and sample tracking. So this template's built using the Data Harmonizer Framework, which was developed by the show group at Simon Fraser University with Damian Dooley. It provides a lot of tools, including in-sheet validation. So this ensures that when a researcher is completing metadata, it's done so in a machine readable and acceptable format, and that all of your required fields are complete. So here you can see some formatting errors and some empty cells that haven't been completed upon metadata entry. And we found that providing this real-time feedback to researchers really increases their likelihood of accurate standardized metadata and willingness to work, work through it and figure out what needs to go where. When an error does occur, uh, Data Harmonizer has a feature that allows you to bring up kind of this like help box when you double click on the header terms. And so this box pops up that provides you information like full term label, definition, what are the requirements and some guidance to how to improve or correct whatever field might be broken within your metadata template. There we go. Um, there's also a jump to and show hide, fe show hide feature that is included in this template. And so this again is just to kind of help researchers navigate this template and understand what they're looking at when and focus their efforts. And it's all to encourage the researcher to enter correct and concise information and interact with them as much as possible. The NMDC is constantly improving and expanding on its features, standards, and tools based on the feedback and review from the scientific community. We have a cohort of ambassadors across many research disciplines to help train, support, and engage their respective communities to lower barriers in adoption and implementation of metadata standards, which is why I asked my question about, you know, how do you, how do you bring people on board? What do you say to them? How do you get them excited about standardized metadata, especially in the short term? Because this is something that we're really focusing on to really build up the use of these standards and ontologies. So the adaptation and recruitment of researchers across these communities is invaluable and really the key to getting these standards implemented and benefiting researchers and improving in data sharing. And so with that, I'll thank you so much for listening. And if you are interested in becoming involved in or learning more about the NMDC, please reach out or visit our website to learn more about engagement opportunities. Thank you, Montana. Um, looks like we have a question from Nico in um, the NMDC data portal. Can the data be grouped by Envo hierarchy? Is Envo used for any of the search, semantic, faceted search, et cetera? Yeah, so when you're on the data portal, there is um, search by environmental type. And so whatever Envo term somebody's put into their, either their environmental triad or whatever term they use for the gold environmental pathways, you can search by that specifically. So if you say, I wanna know everything about every peatland sample that's been submitted to the NMDC portal, you can filter by that. And then there are additional like date filters and depth filters and data type filters. So yeah, we're, that's the kind of stuff we're expanding on. Thank you. Great. Um, let's see if there are any other questions in Zoom chat or on Slack. Um, I think we have time for one more before we move on to Rhiannon. Let's see. Um, not seeing any questions on Slack. So, well, thank you again, Montana. And yeah. our next speaker is Rhiannon Cameron. Uh, Rhiannon is um, at uh, Simon Fraser University and completed her Bachelor of Science in Microbiology in 2019. She's currently a PhD student at the Faculty of Health Sciences at Simon Fraser, working under Dr. Shao's supervision. Uh, her work focuses on ontology curation and development for outbreak investigation and surveillance of SARS-CoV-2 for the Canadian COVID-19 Genomics Network. Um, as well as foodborne pathogen risk assessment modeling for the Antimicrobial Resistance Canadian Genomics Research and Development Institute. 
And the title of her talk are, is Fair Public Health Pathogen Genomics Contextual Data Sharing During the COVID-19 Pandemic. So let's welcome Rhiannon and uh, why don't you get started? Great, thank you so much, Nick. Sure. Yeah, as uh, for the great introduction. So I'm presenting on behalf of our team at the Center for Infectious Disease Genomics and One Health at Simon Fraser University. Um, that also includes Damon, Damon, Damian Dooley, who was already kind of briefly mentioned by Montana, our ontology development um, like department lead and software architect, as well as Dr. Emma Griffiths, our ontology project coordinator, lead curator, and research associate. So rather than repeating the title of the talk, I'll just get into talking about a bit more about using the data harmonizer for data curation, harmonization, as well as our specification work. So to start off, give some context to what spawned this work is um, when the COVID pandemic hit, um, the Canadian COVID Genomics Network was formed as Canada's national SARS-CoV-2 response initiative. Um, we came on as part of that work. Um, and the overarching goals of the project were to get situational awareness of how, um, like ability to detect variants, monitor prevalence and distribution, inform outbreak response, and understand the viral evolution. Um, so we could see if, so that there could be seen if there was increase in transmission or change in clinical severity. So when we started trying to tackle this problem, um, or at least help out with tackling these problems, we found that data flow for Canadian SARS-CoV-2 genomic surveillance was very complicated. Um, Canada's healthcare system is decentralized and thus lacks a single overarching health authority to organize and unify these efforts. Um, so we have non-standardization information systems across institutions, and then we, this ends up with variable and inconsistent genomic contextual data streams going into the National Microbiology Laboratory that are then resulting in difficult to um, integrate and compare data sets, which then can propagate inconsistencies when we try to disseminate information. So we came in to help with um, applying more harmonization effort in between. Um, so we developed uh, working on a data, contextual data standard. Um, and then we also felt like we needed a tool to, operation, opera, opera, <laughs> to operate these standards. Um, and that's where the data harmonizer comes in, which um, has also been mentioned at this point. Um, and this helps kind of collect all the information and we worked with the different provinces and territories to try to find out what their needs were so that everything going to the national database at that point was ideally harmonized and then could be used to understand how COVID-19 has entered Canada before passing it on to other public databases. And so just like a little touch on, and I know Montana already kind of got into this, she was talking more, I guess, about metadata, whereas we're specifically talking about contextual data and I'm not talking about the sequence data, but the data surrounding this that tells the essential story. So we have the sample data for what pathogen we're dealing with, the location where infection probably occurred, who was infected, what was sampled, what the clinical outcomes and lab results were, and what methodologies were applied. This provides critical information for monitoring the origin, spread, and evolution of the pathogen of interest, in this case SARS-CoV-2, and helps inform downstream public health decision making. So data harmonization, um, in this context, we're talking about quality control to ensure consistent vocabulary, formatting, and data structures. And when we are trying to work with the initial incoming data, the, we found various challenges and errors, shorthand, the use of formats that were inconsistent or lack of formatting, um, jargon, semantic ambiguity, and inconsistent collection. But harmonizing this data is really important for interpreting the viral sequence data and analytic results and improving the efficiency of time to response. So we then collaborated with the Public Health Alliance for Genomic Epidemiology, known as PHAGE, to develop the SARS-CoV-2 contextual data standard. It specializes in SARS-CoV-2 COVID and COVID-19 related questions, but we also tried to make these as pathogen as agnostic as possible so that we could reuse different components for different pathogens in the future. The specification was mapped to existing metadata standards and OBO foundry ontologies to increase interoperability and has been adopted and implemented in Canada with the Cancogen Virus Seq database, DNA stack, the National Genomic Surveillance Database, and around the world via Phage, NCBI, Ostraca, CoveGen Network, HGID, BioBab Lim, Spheres, and TOS CDC. Not all necessarily using it exactly as we've implemented it, but certainly taking the components and reusing them. 
However, as kind of alluded to earlier, standards must be operate. <laughs> I cannot say the word um, to be effective. We need it in operation. Otherwise, if it's not convenient, people are not going to use it. So in comes the data harmonizer, which looking at the interface is looking familiar to what uh, we were seeing from the MDC. So the data harmonizer was an application that we built to enable standardized data entry and validation. It has um, different saving and export options, um, ability to change what fields you're using based on what your requirements are so that you're not necessarily dealing with overwhelm and irrelevant fields for your work, um, a validating process, additional help information, the options to select various different templates and even create your own, and then additional guidance information built into the application that is dynamically generated from your template. Every submitting provincial public healthcare lab had their own instance and it was there, everything was offline because privacy was a very big concern for our stakeholders and um, we wanted to make sure everything was secure. And it's now um, one of the benefits too of having kind of this separation is it's um, also um, publicly and open source on GitHub. And so that's how um, we started collaborating with the NMD, the National Microbiome Database Project and they have their own adaptation of it now. So just a little kind of quick preview. Um, Montana already got into this, so I won't get into it much, but just, yeah, we have dynamically generated information in the headers and it's automatic. And then contextual data color coding for yellow being required, this needs to go in, purple being recommended for enhanced edit, metadata options and gray being optional or localization and like standardizations that we tried to do so we could accommodate other people who are just trying to standardize their data set, but it wasn't necessarily what everybody needed. Um, our validation process has robust validation expressions, intuitive feedback, and widgets to help with data entry. We have your basic spreadsheet copy and paste edit functionalities. We have fill column, which we particularly like because it also, it only fills column where you have a specimen collector ID. So if you actually have a row that's missing something out of hundreds of rows, it's not going to accidentally cause like errors by creating um, a fill where it shouldn't be. We can jump to column, which is really great when you have over 100 columns in a spreadsheet to find where you need to be. And then different import save export functions, specifically looking at different downstream destinations. So you can enter your data once and then export into different submission formats. So while you did use the maybe our, again, our CanCogen specification for this purpose at a lab, you can still send it to the National Microbiology Laboratory. If you want to, you can then send it off to GSAID and then off to BioSample, you can make these adaptations with just an export button. Future development includes adding flexibility to make your own template variations like, um, and specification like variations within the application. And then also to enable, enable tabular export of ontology IDs as an alternative or in addition to term labels. Um, seeing as I'm already kind of stretching time, I won't really get into what is an ontology. I think a lot of people already know what that is, but how we chose to be part of the Open Biological and Biomedical Ontology Foundry, which to put it lightly, is just a family of orthogonal collaborative ontologies that act like volumes of an encyclopedia, all organized under a general basic formal ontology. And this helped make it so our specification work was findable, accessible, and interoperable and reusable. This is a brief look at some of the encyclopedias we pulled off the shelf to then try to apply it to the different sections of our specification and then modeling it for implementation within the application. In summary, the COVID-19 pandemic highlighted how disparate data sources in Canada result in variability when sharing data, resulting in data sets that are difficult to integrate and compare. The data harmonizer tool facilitated standardized data entry and validation, and ontology has helped make this data fair while providing a controlled vocabulary. The data harmonizer is a tool built for CanCon and SARS-CoV-2 surveillance, but its open source and dynamic implementation facilitates repurposing for research, food safety, other pathogens, and more. And I'd like to fully thank the rest of the SIDGO team and the data harmonization and metadata harmonization team specific. And thank you all for listening. Thank you, Rhiannon. That was a great talk. A um, couple of questions here. Uh, one from Charlie on slide six, was this alluding to some kind of named entity normalization system? On slide six.
There, I can screen share again. I'm just going to roll back. Hope it's not showing me my slide numbers. Let's see, is there we go. Um, sorry. So the chat, some named entity. Named so, entity normalization. So, a little um, bit of context on this is, is it's finding like, you know, some kind of standardization for the text that names like COVID-19. Yes, yeah. So we were putting in standardized pick lists into the into the standard that are then all ontologized terms to make sure that people for things like COVID-19, that would be a controlled vocabulary for that. Well, we do have fields that have free text. Um, we try to do recurring vocabulary to be a con as controlled as possible, but then also be readily available and flexible for people who have maybe needs so that we can actually meet their demands. Otherwise, we find people aren't going to use a controlled vocabulary. Did that answer your question? Yes. I wish you good luck with that because when you don't have a strict controlled vocabulary, people just don't use controlled vocabulary. There's no like fine line in the middle as far as I know. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a that was a big motivation for doing this because we were getting, I mean, even within pro across provinces and territories, they aren't harmonized. They can have different health regions within them. They can have different agencies within them and they're doing everything differently as I, I mean, everyone here knows. That's why we're all here, right? Um, trying to make it so that these problems aren't problems in actually doing the analyses. Um, and then, sorry, I see there's a couple questions from Nico. Um, if I'm right, oh, going over time, I can also, we can respond in chat. Damien's here too, we can chat. Um, as an aside, this is the second talk mentioning the same curation tool. This relates to the panel discussion before. If you were to invest into improving a tool like that, it'd make, make it really good. Every talk seller would get multiplied. Um, yeah, and that's something like, it's been really great that we, we started collaborating with N, uh, NMDC to kind of talk about, hey, does this tool meet your needs? What are you guys doing that we can kind of like work together on? And it's wonderful to see like more and more people putting in their um, their time and I guess like their funded time into um, making sure that a tool gets built up instead of going obsolete. Is the data harmonizer developed only by one group or is it an effort that is con contributions from many projects? So it started off as our one group, but we are now expanding out with the NMDC being a good example of trying to like allow other instances to be developed and then kind of get in a feedback loop of like, okay, well, how can we develop the base model to support your work and how does your work should we be playing? What elements of your work should we be playing? Oh, and there Damien's getting into it a bit more. So maybe I'll leave this conversation to continue in the chat so I don't uh, keep rolling over time, but thank you so much. Thank you, Rhiannon. And um... Everybody, our next speaker is Lauren Wishney from University at Buffalo. Um, and uh, she is presenting on her work. Um, you ready to get started, Lauren? You're on mute. I'm on mute. Or Lauren's on mute. Lauren's on mute. Oh. Sorry. All right. <laughs> I was saying it's possible. I really appreciate it. I have a nice view out of a train window, as you can't see. <laughs> Lauren, it might work better if you leave the video off. Okay, good idea. So, uh, Nick, Everybody are you or am I going to, to present the slides? Um, I can present them. I have it loaded right now. Um, just go to slideshow. Uh, from the beginning, I'll share my screen. Okay. Everybody see that? So mm. the title of Lauren's talk is an ontological. Sorry, I can't see it actually. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's still, it's still, still loading. Load. Oh. Okay, I can see it now. There we go. You see it? Okay. Title of Lauren's talk is An Ontological Approach to Standardization and Analysis of Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Data. So let's take it okay. away. Okay. All right. Um, so thank you once again, everybody, for, uh, for having me. Um, 
Are you, are you uh, actually, sorry, Nick, are you, do you have it in slideshare mode or is it still in, uh, oh, it's in like It should be in mode. slideshow mode. Um, okay, we're, we're okay. looking at like the PowerPoint window right now. Oh. Right there. You see it now? No. It's That's still the in the, mode. yeah, it's not in presenter mode. I don't know why. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> um. Are you seeing it now? Okay, now it's like the now it's like the cheat mode that has the notes. Oh, hmm. which I think is slightly better. Okay. Yeah, I'm not seeing that. Oh yeah, let me uh, display settings. Maybe you just want to go to duplicate slideshow. Oh, there. There we go. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. That's perfectly fine. Thank you again. Um, all right. Hi, everybody. So um, Nick already told you what my, my the name of my presentation is. So thank you all for having me. I'm um, from the Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Science in Buffalo. And I'm excited to talk to you all about uh, the Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging data, um, the ADNI data, if you, if you haven't heard about it. Uh, next slide, please. So just a really brief introduction. Next slide. Okay, so just a brief overview of the ADNI data. So basically the ADNI data is um, the result of years and years of, of longitudinal data collection from um, people with Alzheimer's disease, as well as people who are cognitively quote unquote normal and people with mild cognitive impairment. And the idea behind uh, collecting these data is to try and identify potential markers for Alzheimer's disease, whether those are, are biomarkers, uh, like different proteins that you would find in, in serum and cerebrospinal fluid, um, different, different markers that show up on MRI and PET scans of the brain, and even uh, test results. So like neuropsychological testing results uh, that's done on patients to test uh, where they are at cognitively. So uh, this is a very heterogeneous data set that we're dealing with with the data set. Um, next slide. Okay, so um, I'm interested in, in that data set for, for those reasons, but also why am I interested in standardizing this data set at all? Um, this is a, a larger piece of my, this is, this is a piece of my larger dissertation. Um, so my, my goal in my dissertation is to try and address evidence gaps in health IT and informatics methods. So um, even though we love evidence-based practice in health IT, we love evidence-based practice in biomedical informatics and hopefully in bio lack of evidence-based practice um, typically done in our field, especially in biomedicine. Um, so much of what's done is kind of based on assumptions rather than evidence. So we kind of assume that biomedical ontologies improve uh, data standards, or we assume that they will improve uh, downstream results, um, but there's not actually a lot of data to back this up. So um, I won't get into how I'm testing this because it's, it's way beyond the scope of biocuration, but I just wanted to give some context as to to sort of why look at ontologies, uh, why look at the ADNI database in particular. So next slide, please. Okay, so um, the ADNI knowledge base or the potential utility of, of an ADNI knowledge base uh, would be uh, first of all to standardize data. So um, the ADNI data are collected across different locations throughout the world, they're collected by different people at different times. Well, the, the people who designed the project have gone to great lengths to establish relatively consistent protocols. They're still not, the data are still not nearly as consistent as they could be or as clear as they could be. Um, there's precise meanings of variables and other data elements that are missing or are lost or just are not clear in the ADNI data. Um, so the idea is to, to disambiguate exactly what the ADNI data are saying, exactly what the variables mean. Um, and so, so the result of that would be a much more usable, searchable, queryable 
knowledge base that people can filter according to different needs. So if they want to search by the type of data, when the data were collected, where they were collected, um, patients in a certain group, like only patients with mild cognitive impairment or only patients with an Alzheimer's diagnosis. Um, right now, as the ID data stands, it's very, it's, it's really difficult to access and, and, and get the data that you actually want because the data are just kind of stored in Excel files and the, the updates are not necessarily documented um, in, a, in a concise way or in a way that's easy to find for most people. So uh, there's a lot of potential improvement for using the, these really valuable data. Please go ahead. Okay, next slide. Okay, next slide. Thank you. Ah, I'm running running short on time already. Well, wow. okay, so really quickly, um, part of what I want to do here is to disentangle what the data are actually saying. So to do that, um, all you bio curators know, we consult the data dictionary, protocols that were written by the researchers, any other documents uh, for explanations or definitions of what each variable actually means. Um, so in my case, I will be, uh, if there are, are not ontology terms that, that go with these variables, um, I will be creating definitions for them that are compliant with both the basic formal ontology and the ontology for general medical science. And those are both oboe compliant. Um, so, uh, so, so there's, there's that goal of interoperability as well. Um, there's also several instances of naming ambiguities, different variables that point to the same thing might have different names um, or two variables that point to okay and these are just a, a few examples of how the data are set up so you can see along the top row we have the the variable names and the columns um, so some that add any data these um, be themselves for the patient and for the, the site taken. So there's definitely several axes on which these data can be merged, they have in common. Um, next slide, please. Oh, sorry, next slide. I don't know if you heard. Did I lose you guys? Are you still there? I mean, we lost you for a couple seconds. I'm still here. Ah, um, oh, sorry. Okay, we can actually go ahead and skip this slide okay. because it's just more examples of the ambiguities. And I, I know I'm running low on time here. Um, so again, this is just an example of the data dictionaries uh, that, that the ADNI data set supplies. Um, now you can see, and under that text column there in the middle, um, there's supposed to be definitions. There's supposed to be explanations of what the variables mean. And those are so that means we have to go into the literature and figure out what these, what these variables mean based on context. Um, so once we have the data sort of disentangled and disambiguated, in tandem with that, we also are identifying relevant ontology terms that can be reused in the data, the ADNI ontology, again, to facilitate that interoperability. So the next step, um, is where it gets kind of difficult um, and where you might think I'm creating a lot of extra work for myself. Um, the next step is to fully axiomatize all of the definitions that we're creating in CLIF. Um, the idea is that for each patient, uh, the CLIF statements can be reused so that eventually you have full axiomatization of all of the data and the ontology uh, and that they are connected. Um, so the idea is we're mapping the ADNI data headers to the ADNI ontology terms, just using an Excel sheet like many of you have seen before. Next slide. Okay, so just a real quick look at the results. Next slide. So again, this is just kind of a preliminary uh, thing that I'm showing you guys, but this is just an example of the data ontology mapping. So you can see um, we have uh, in the second column there, we have all of the names of variables. Oh, sorry, I think we went too far. Um, 
And then we have an explanation of the data uh, and then the ontology term, the closest ontology term that that variable maps to. Um, and that was actually on the previous slide. Um, I don't know if anybody got a look, I can go back to those slides if necessary. Uh, and then what, what just showed on the screen was a really, just a quick example of an axiomatization of a piece of the ADNI data to show how- Sorry how to interrupt, uh, but we have like, you have like 20, 15, 20 seconds. No, that's okay, I'm finishing up right now. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, if you could just go to the next slide, I'll, I'll wrap up here. Okay, so the next steps, um, after we've done this full axiomatization and we've made our cliff axioms available to be used in, in OWL as well in Protege, um, those can be formally connected to the ADNI data using an extension called Selfie. I don't know if anyone here has ever used Selfie to do mappings between uh, data and ontology terms. Um, but the idea is uh, once we have done this, we can then study uh, the effects of implementing a realism-based ontology. So once we create um, this knowledge base, we can then compare uh, how would this knowledge base function with uh, SNOMED terms maybe instead of the ADNI ontology terms or non-interoperable ontology terms. Like I think Nico mentioned some of the terms in, from ontologies in BioPortal, most of which are either not finished or have been kind of abandoned or don't adhere to any kind of outside standard. Um, so the idea there is to be able to see, okay, do we actually see a measurable effect by implementing an ontology? And we're looking at um, query results and statistical analysis results to make that happen. But that's that's down the road, um, basically. So I, I just wanted to, to show the initial mapping and how, how I've done the axioms. And I, I think that's my time. Um, I'm not waiting yeah. for time already. Thank you. So Thank you, I Lauren. will <clears throat> give it give you guys a chance to ask questions. Thank you so much. Sure, I think we have time for one, maybe two questions. Um, first one from Charlie. I uh, would love some follow-up information about how you're doing the assessment. Also, have you considered doing curation of these new terms within some of the pre-existing OBO ontologies that are meant to cover these areas, such as DO, Mondo, EFO, and HPO? Yes. Um, actually, I think there are a couple of EFO terms that I have that I have used. Um, Mondo, I have not used. Um, I've been using Uberon, actually, for the... Uh, so there are there are brain scans, like MRI scans, um, and so for the brain regions, I've been using Uberon um, so far. Um, and as far as those other ones, I, I know for a fact there are other uh, obo ontologies that will that will be part of this. So yeah, the goal is to reuse as many of those as possible. Great. Um, then I, uh, Charlie also said uh, Excel to Protege seems like a nice candidate for some of the modern ontology generation tools as well. Uh, mm -hmm. How well does this hold up in other Alzheimer's disease data sets? ADNI is pretty old these days, and there are tons of others that have been mapped to each other and compared. In, uh, uh, yeah, such I as mean, Neuro, ADNI is AD definitely, Neuromed. Yeah, it's definitely not the only one. I mean, ideally, like people are people are still using the ADNI data, um, even though it, it has been going on now for some time, people are still putting out publications on it all the time, in part because it's, you know, you already have the data, you can go and do analyses on it pretty easily. So the idea is just to make it easier for those people who are using it. And then, you know, ideally, you, you know, th those things that you mentioned give me something to look at so that Ultimately, if we want to be interoperable with these other data sets, if that's something that's possible, I can, I will be able to do that with the way that I'm standardizing these data. But I would actually have to look into how that's been done on these other data sets to make sure that, you know, how I'm doing it would, would even be interoperable with those other data sets. But, but that's right. kind of the goal. So that definitely gives me something more to think about. Okay. Well, thank you, Lauren. And um, yeah, thank you guys we'll so much. Move on to our next speaker. Thank you. Awesome. Who is um, next is Solomon or Sal Sharif from University of Maryland. Uh, Sal is a graduate student in the Mac McCarroll Group, who works in organic chemistry, development operations, force field development, quantum chemistry, and artificial intelligence. Uh, the title of his talk is Global Chem, the Chemical Knowledge Graph of, small, of Common Small Molecules and their UPAC Smile Smarts 
for a selection of compounds relevant to diverse chem uh, chemical communities. Uh, so, you ready, Saul? Yeah. Yes. And can you see my screen? Oh, do I need to share your, uh, can you share your screen, Saul? Looking good. I'm sharing yeah. it. Do you see it? Yep. All right. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Cool. Um, all right, so I'll go right in and I'll, I'll give you guys my story. Um, so uh, a little while ago, about two years ago, my boss was like, um, select some compounds out of the enamine database set, which is about 20 billion right now in my list, and um, come up with a couple, a good list to parameterize to add to something that we call a force field. Um, and so uh, this force field is how they run a lot of these molecular dynamic simulations, and we keep track of um, all these different compounds and their interactions and, and that stuff. So it's relevant to us to add compounds that will be significant. Um, if you do it in an arbitrary way, then the adding to the force field won't really improve as much because now you're just adding junk probably. So I don't need all the compounds. I just need the best ones. And to do that, um, I created this knowledge graph of all the relevant compounds to people in general, because I'm creating a general network, not just something that's for drug design. Um, so I hit a lot of different areas of like narcotics, proteins, um, cannabis, uh, sex products, food, things that are like very general for, for people. Um, to, to record the information, I needed to go back to through some time in history. Um, me as an organic chemist, like I studied IUPAC and then IUPAC was developed in the early or the late 1800s and it had certain rules, but uh, these rules were, were there because people didn't have a way to name compounds. And then slowly over time, IUPAC was developed into this language and then there's like a more natural language where people are like, okay, something that sounds a little bit more natural, I can call it like this. And then it just developed into the, like these, these English characters that are like, I can sound this out like oxalane or tetrahydrofuran. Um, around the 1980s, uh, a language developed called SMILES to represent these chemical structures into a 1D string was kind of developed. And uh, subsections of that language, like SMARTS and SMIRCs, were developed by the same family members uh, over at UC Berkeley. And to, to understand SMILES, it's, um, you, you can write the molecule in, in a 1D format. And if you haven't seen this before, like you guys have probably seen THF, which is used a lot in, in industry. And to write the smiles, you can see here that like, um, I'm kind of representing the, <clears throat> the letters by the color code. And so the green circle here is the this, this C1. And then enclosed within the ring, I put CCO. So you can see that installing the letters is, um, oh, whoops. it's kind of like enclosing it between these two carbons. And then everything inside of that string is like, that's part of the, the ring. And so when you write more and more complicated molecules, you can do more in complex strings. And how you write their strings is, um, is a whole other art form. The other language that was developed is these atom type languages. So similarly, like they use the same graph theory under the hood and they came up with their own nomenclature. So these are a lot of the quantum chemists or physicists and how they describe these like atoms in more acute environments. Whereas like you've got smiles that are just the general molecule, then you've got the functional group, which is like, here's a kind of a bigger picture. So it's going more and more acute in. Um, so this is where I kind of like decided, okay, I would like to, uh, I have mechanisms to go from the smallest to the atom types, um, but there is no mechanism to go from the smallest to the IU pack. Uh, so on my hunt through all this data, I needed to, to just, um, come up with a couple of rules. So I wrote about 3000 functional groups and I have a lot of that in memory. So like, I know a lot of these guys now uh, and I wrote it manually because I needed to understand the data. And as I was writing it manually, I started governing a couple of rules, which be like, okay, this is how I should write it um, and stick to a standard that myself can maintain. And slowly other people have, have been adopting it. And so some of these is like, in the IUPAC name, I, I wanted to be more natural. So I just removed anything that was numbering. And if the name didn't 
if it had numbers in it, I would find like a, a synonym or something that like probably had that, that name. So I, I just wanted something more natural sounding and it more, maybe less complex. Not every time did, did that really uh, work because sometimes the IU pack is not as flexible, but I, I tried to make it kind of figure it out. Um, other things that I, I did there was um, in the IU pack polymer rule book, they've got site points in the name. So um, site points is like where the molecule will bind or do something or like where, like you're trying to mark a certain selective point on there. And in the English language, they put this Y out and they would, put it between the numbers and so like uh it would be like okay at this certain point this is where this thing is kind of interacting this is for polymer chains where they've got the repeated monomer chains um and so i just removed that because i'm just like okay this is a little bit more too complicated and i don't want site point configuration in there either i removed stereochemistry because that could be determined by the molecule itself like i can tell if it's going to be like or you could determine the stereochemistry but i guess if you remove transgenic cis, you might lose some information, but I just needed to get rid of it to make this easier. Um, common reactions that I've seen, so like in organic chemistry, there's a lot of reactions. And so uh, as you go through these functional group transformations, you, you need to record which functional group is the most relevant. And like something is like Diaz Alder, which you guys have all seen from undergrad, uh, I recorded it like you put your reactants here installed by like a virtual particle, which can trick the RD kit compiler, and then a P1, P2, which is the products. I put that trick in the compiler there to like add as a separation in the 1D string. Um, so I did that data curation, wrote it all, distributed it, yada. And then each node on that network, I ran through the, the force field. The force field was originally intended for drug likes or drug like molecules. And so like things that it was intended for like rings and drugs, which is like, the most popular ring systems reported by the FDA that's getting reported through phase three trial drugs, like you can see is performing pretty good. And we'll use this purple marker here, which we call like a penalty score. And the lower the penalty score, the more performant the force field. Um, and so <clears throat> something that's like narcotics is schedule one reported by the FDA. Um, like you can see here, like a lot of the penalty scores are lower than the, the 200, even lower than 100, because these are drugs. And so like it should be um, performant for that. Whereas something like you've got perfluoroalkyls, kills, which is like long alkyl chains surrounded by fluorine. The penalty scores are, are kind of like reaching towards the 200 and above it, which is kind of like these are herbicides reported by the EPA, so the Environmental Protection Agency. So it's not as um, performant on that because these are herbicides. And sorry, I've got a chat. Uh, you have about a minute left, so. Okay, so I came up with all these tools to select compounds, and these are all distributed on CoLab notebooks. So I didn't want to write a front end and maintain it. And the graph database is on GitHub. But the last thing I really want to end this with is uh, out of all these 3,000 compounds, I came up with a choice of five compounds to give to my boss to be like, okay, let's add these. Um, and a question I'd want to raise to you guys is probably like, which one do you think he selected? Hmm. Anyone? We can yell something out. <laughs> we have one comment here from Charlie. Je definitely not a zero dean. Yeah, that's nonsense. Why do you think azeridine is nonsense? No, 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 it's not nonsense. I feel like it's just it's just like a more of a building block than a molecule that you'd like, really want to use. I feel like I'm going to be wrong now. Yeah, yeah, you will be. So, and <laughs> vitamin C is another one. Vitamin C is is uh, interesting that that was kind of missing because that's a very common molecule. But azeridine is a very interesting and valuable molecule today because it's coming out as an emerging covalent warhead. And covalent warhead inhibitors are very um, people are understanding how to use them. Azeridine is also great for ring opening uh, metathesis where you can join two carbons on and a nitrogen. So it's really powerful in organic synthesis. It's a valuable functional group transformation. So he actually chose two things, which was azeridine and vitamin C. Um, and I guess the last slide is, I run a team of, of pretty powerful people um, and 
like a lot of these guys work in the wet lab. Uh, some of these guys work in like DevOps. I think Chris wrote that Git commit feature for GitHub. Uh, these guys have helped me out in little parts of the projects here and there. Uh, my boss is Alex and he came up with the terminology of common and rare. And so, um, and this is my little picture of me. This is something I find really beautiful in chemistry. So it's one of my drugs that I synthesize in staff. Uh, that's it. Great. Well, thank you, Saul. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple of questions here. Uh, one from Harry Caulfield. Um, regarding global chem, are there any links between the curated set and KEBI or another chemical ontology? Yeah, so like, um, I only went through mostly the zinc database and their trench setup is confusing and a lot of the stuff I went through the zinc database is a little bit uh sketchy on my end um and I I found like like going through the smiles as well like it's not as clear um and the IUPAC name is, is not as clear like uh they come up with more random arbitrary ontologies like ways to name things like everyone's got a base set but as you get to more like esoteric communities it's gets to be just wildfire so like um i don't know I'm, we could do more comparisons i'm open to that to see okay well um and there's a related question uh charlie have you assessed how well compounds in your resource are represented in kebby or kemble sorry say that again have you assessed how well the compounds in your resource are represented in kebby or Kemble, T H E M B L. No, I, I haven't. And like my goal of this paper has been to, um, there's been a couple of things, but like the, the main goal is to see how it performs in different force fields. So like, uh, I don't know if you're aware of like Amber, Charm and, and that stuff from coming from those quantum guys, but uh, and kind of seeing how they perform in that set rather than chemical data sets. Okay, great. Um, well, I think it's, um, thanks again, Saul. And um, I think you can move on to the next talk. If anybody has other questions, they can message you. Um, so let's move on to the next speaker, who is um, Daniela Rassiti. Uh, Daniela is, did I, did I pronounce your name correctly, Daniela? Yes, thank you. Sure. Um, so she is executive editor for micro publication biology, as well as curator at Wormbase. Um, both are based out of Caltech in Pasadena. And with micro publication biology, Daniela advocates for including curation in the publication workflow. And she will be speaking with us about facilitating author curation pre publication through micro publication biology. So are you ready to take it away? Thank you very much, Nick. Daniela. Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, I can okay. hear you fine. Great. I hope you can bear with me. I'm the last one of the day. So hello, everyone. Uh, before starting, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present our work today. I will be talking about our efforts at Micropublication Biology. Uh, to facilitate author curation pre-publication. Uh, Karen Yuk is uh, uh, my colleague, is in the audience and will be happy to answer, quest answer questions via chat. All right, so for those of you who are not familiar with micropublication biology, I will give a very short introduction. So micropublication is a journal that was started by knowledge bases and in particularly by Wormbase. It is an online nonprofit open access journal. We publish uh, single experiment data. The submissions are peer reviewed. They are discoverable in Europe PMC, PMC and PubMed. And most importantly, we work with community databases for data vetting and curation. Our ultimate goal is then to include authors in the curatorial workflow. And I will show you in a minute how we're gonna do that. Uh, these are the people involved, the main, uh, the core micropublication team. You may know some of them already. Paul Sternberg is our editor in chief. He's a PI at the one of the PIs at the Alliance of Genome Resources and the PI for Wormbase. Uh, Tim Schedel is our senior science officer. Karen and I are executive editors. 
uh, Todd and Nick, they are taking care of the technical part and Sarah is our publishing editor. So uh, the motivation behind the micropublication project is really twofold. We wanted to uh, give authors the opportunity to publish data that would otherwise remain unpublished because they were too small to be uh, published uh, as a standalone um, article. And uh, we want to incentivize authors to enter data into knowledge bases. So I probably, I don't have to explain to this audience why databases are so important for uh, data dissemination and are so important in scholarly communication, but uh, really they, um, they do a great deal to enhance data discoverability and interoperability. So how do we get data into knowledge bases from a publisher perspective? Uh, first of all, we want to make curation part of the publication workflow. Uh, we want that uh, curation happens when data are newly released. And we know how important that is because um, taking care of errors post-publication is so hard. And we want to reward authors for curating their data, their data by giving them a citable um, piece of um, uh, scholarly communication. So um, how do we uh, put curation in the workflow? Uh, this is generally uh, what my micropublication operates. Uh, an author submits an article, and then a micropublication editor evaluates the submission. And I want to stress out that all our micropublication editor are uh, knowledge-based curators. So at this point, they already can assess uh, if the article adheres to nomenclature standards. Uh, if the um, micropublication editor approves and then uh, we're sending the submission to a, a scientific officer, which is a senior editor. And then the workflow is similar to many, uh, to all the other journals. We send it out for peer review. But where we differ is that then um, before moving on to publication, we alert a database curator to make sure that the paper is curatable. And this, um, curator here and this curator here can be the same person, but could also be different persons. For instance, uh, if I receive a model for human disease uh, paper, I'm not a disease curator, so I would ping our disease curator and make sure that all the data is there. And uh, once we get this feedback, we will ask the authors to incorporate it in the, in the publication, uh, both the curator and uh, um, reviewer feedback. And only then, then we move on and publish the paper online. So why a database curator? We know that uh, um, database curators are the ones who know the community standards. Uh, they know the database practices and all the information needed for curation. And this will allow a less back and forth with the authors to fix nomenclature post-publication, which is tedious and uh, often doesn't happen. Um, so I would really like to publicly acknowledge all the people involved in this. Uh, we work with several databases. The persons that are marked with a star are curators. The other are uh, senior scientists that are our um, science officers. Uh, so thank you to Warmbase Curator. Uh, we work with Flybase as well, with SGD, with Zfin with many model organisms, databases, Xembase, Dictibase, Pombase. So thanks all the curators for making really articles better. Uh, we also work with TEAR. I see Leonard is here and Sue is here. Uh, so thank you um, for your feedback, uh, Maze GDD and Sol Genomic Network. Um, so we are also establishing collaborations with uh, other communities to set up um, editorial teams. So specifically, we're working with Proteopedia for Structural Biology, Ag Biodata, uh, Cotton, and uh, VU Path DB. Uh, however, we received submissions from other groups and fields, and uh, we will need help to establish community buy-in, uh, to establish editorial teams and database connections. Uh, so if you are uh, part of these groups and you want to help out, reach out to us. I give the uh, contact information uh, at the end of the talk. Um, so I told you that our ultimate goal is to uh, have authors curate data and enter it directly into knowledge bases directly from uh, the publication. And how are we planning to do that? Uh, so this is in the near future. 
we plan to have authors uh, submitting the micropublication and curate the data right away. And then the workflow continue as before and the uh, managing editor evaluates the submission, the science officer approves, it gets peer reviewed. And then the database curator at this point will not need to uh, curate the data but would rather validate author curation and as before we will incorporate feedback from curators and then we can move on to publication so uh, we know that curate um, sorry authors need to be trained uh, to do proper curation so we are building tools to facilitate knowledge transfer to knowledge bases and this is the work uh, of uh, nick stiflin and valeria arnaboldi uh, so we uh, broke down the process into two steps. Uh, the first is entity extraction and the second one is fact annotation. So for entity extraction, uh, we have this um, um, split screen view uh, for now is only for uh, curators, but um, it will be pushed down to production with authors. So the authors and the curators see the article to the left hand side, the entities are uh, recognized, highlighted and displayed in a tabular format. So if a false positive is extracted, the, the author would simply need to click on an X. Um, we also have an entity prediction tool that works on regular expressions. So in this case, this train and this allele were new entities, so they could not have been recognized by uh, our previous tool, but they are predicted entities. So in this case, the authors can again eliminate false positives, or they can add new entities in case there was a false negative. The this has been incredibly incredibly useful already uh, for uh, edit for managing editors as you see in this case uh, there was a trans gene that was uh, recognized because it was present in worm base one trans gene was not recognized and this is because the authors inserted a typo so we immediately got back and asked hey do you mean that this is a, yet another uh, trans gene and in fact, it was a typo. So these things are really hard to see, are things that reviewers missed and curators catch when they are trying to enter data into the database. But when you just read the article, they are very hard to catch. Um, the second tool that we are building is a, a fact annotation tool. So basically it builds on what you've just seen on all the extracted entities they pre-populate a schema, in this case is a gene expression annotation form, which is based on the uh, schema that was developed at the Alliance of Genome Resources. So uh, all the genes extracted will populate the gene column, anatomy terms, um, obviously via the anatomy ontology, will populate the anatomy column, life stages, and, and so forth. And all the authors will need to do to make an annotation, it would be to click uh, on the entities to create uh, um, the assertion. Um, obviously, the curator will vet the author submission, as I shown you before, before the data is transferred to the knowledge base. Uh, we tested this um, to see performance. Uh, we checked 14 papers, uh, gene expression papers, uh, and we have seen that the average time to curate uh, uh, with the tool, it was uh, significantly less uh, than the average time with uh, our worm based curation interface. So we are, we are excited. Uh, all right, so in summary, uh, today I've shown you how we're trying to include curation in the publication process, and this is very valuable for knowledge bases so that they have ready data for database integration, and uh, also the importance of having curators uh, directly interact and communicate with author pre-publication. They can educate them in adhering to best practices. And what we notice is that when authors are submitting another, a second paper, they really are paying attention to uh, nomenclature and, um, and uh, complying with the model organism um, guidelines. Um, so thank you for your attention. Um, this is our Twitter handle, uh, our website. And if you are a database and you would like to partner with us, please reach out to editors at micropublication.org. Thank you, Daniela. And um, I hope I wasn't a... too fast or <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if I had time. Yes, it was uh, just in time. Um, I think there was a question. There were a couple of questions in chat here. 
Um, there was one, which EPT do you use? Birgit, what is the EPT? I'm sorry for my- oh, sorry. Um, yeah, oh, the entity to... recognition tool. Oh. So we are using a bioentity.link that was developed by Karen. Uh, Karen is here if uh, um, you had more specific questions. It's just a simple string matching algorithm. Uh, the tools we use are built uh, in-house into uh, specifically into our uh, submission platform. We can certainly go over it more if you want. Yeah, thanks. So you do it for each entity type that you're interested in? Right. Well, we, right, we have lexica of genes, alleles, variations, strains, whatever you want, and we build a keyword set from those different lexica. And then those keyword sets are run across uh, our, um, our articles. And right. you can whatever combination of keyword sets you want. You can, so and can, it's very flexible. And is, can you deal with synonyms? Like if you're looking for ontology terms, do you know which ones are actually to be mapped to the same one or is it all we, individual keywords? Yeah, it's straight string matching. So yeah. um, we don't have um, synonym matching yet. Um, for the fact extraction tool, that's where we do use ontology terms and people can, um, you know, if we, didn't find something, they can uh, do a search within the ontology to populate that field. They can also add terms. So um, it's it won't go back to the ontology per se, but at least we capture everything. Okay. Great, I think it's uh, time to, to cut yeah. off the discussion there. I just put a link in the chat. I think this is a great discussion that should keep on going. If you need a place to host that chat, feel free to hop on to our ISB Slack channel. Um, I think as we come to an end, why don't we double check with, with Federica and she's gonna tell us a little bit about what's coming up next for ISB as the, the year comes to an end. Thank you, Charlie. So uh, since the second session of ISB 2022 is now coming to an end, I would like to thank, first of all, our panelists and speakers for such a great discussion and uh, great talks, and also our chair and moderator, Nick uh, and Charlie. And uh, yeah, uh, we are going to have a last session, the further last session of the ISB 2022 virtual conference uh, that is going to take place October 4th. And uh, it will feature the uh, annual general meeting of the International Science for Biocuration, the Biocuration Awards, and also uh, the same uh, we did last year, we are going to have a poster session on Gather Town. And uh, we hope you enjoyed this second session today, and we really look forward to seeing you attending the first session in October. Great, well, thanks to all the speakers and um, all of those attending and panelists. and. Um, to Federica and Charlie. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank bye. you bye. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye. 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 Thanks.